the Cold War, 1945-1952-ish. So here we go. Today is March 5th. Hey, happy, uh, well, when is my dad's birthday, but happy uh, Boston Massacre Day, 1770. It's Cold War. All right, so after the after World War II, we're going to have a boom with regard to economics. This slide doesn't really talk about that. Let's talk about the Taft-Hartley Act first. So the Taft-Hartley Act, the government is going to try to shut down some of these uh, union activities. Um, remember, the unions who are, are going to get the people together, and they're going to go on strikes. And so the Taft-Hartley Act is going to say... Here are, are a list of types of strikes that are, are illegal. So, for example, you can't strike for somebody else, like somebody else who works. Uh, the, these workers are going to strike for, uh, for a different company. Um, you can't have a strike that is a general population strike, like, oh, look, this one fast food restaurant is doing this, so we're all going to then strike. Um, you can't have... Uh, anyway, there's a, there's a list, list of these things. They also uh, are going to outlaw the idea of closed shops. So a closed shop means that when you are, uh, you have to be a member of the labor union to then be hired, um, or you have to join the union to be hired. Uh, and so that is now illegal. You can't force somebody to join a union. When we talk about unions here, you know, in, in my life, we have a teacher's union that uh, you know, we have the, the NEA, which is the National Education, uh, Education Association. We have the OEA, Oklahoma Education Association. And then we have our school, the WHEA. And they're, all, they're all kind of like, uh, I was going to say, in a federalist kind of a thing. Um, so, but you don't have to be a teacher. You don't, have to be, you don't have to join the union to be a teacher at the school. Pros and cons, pros and cons. Pros... Uh, would be, from the teacher point of view, would be that you have the backing. If something were to go wrong, say you're sued by for some reason, then the union could help you out with lawyer fees and things like that. The cons, the cons are that you have to pay dues to be in the union. So, pros and cons, right? Taft-Hartley Act says you can't force somebody to join a union to go to work. Also, the Taft-Hartley Act sa <laughs> said... Um, you can't force the union labor. Uh, well, no, they, they can. <laughs> they, I was going to say, we now can't. Uh, but you can force the union labor leaders to sign non communist oaths. That's in the Taft Hartley Act. They have to sign non communist oaths. So uh, at that time, the word communist meant terrorist. It meant subversive, it meant fifth column, it meant somebody who's going to cause anarchy, just the word communist um, back then. I, you could argue it still means that today. Uh, I grew up in the Cold War, so it doesn't, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, and that got passed in 1950, 1950, in 1965, the Supreme Court ruled and said, no, you can't tell people that they have to, that they can't be a communist to be in a union. So there you go, which is why, no, I don't know where I was going to go with that. Operation Dixie. The unions are going to push down into the south and try to get the, the industries down there to unionize. The problem with Operation Dixie is that a union is formed by all the workers in a factory, right, or all the workers in a company. The, and here we are in the, 19, the late 1940s and the early 1950s, and we're still having issues with race relations. And so when you have the poor whites who are working in the factories are making the same amount of money as the poor African Americans who are in the factories, they're not going to they're not going to get together. They're not going to form a union. They're not going to they're not going to eat lunch together. That's just how it's going to be in the early 1950s. And so it's going to fall apart. Operation Dixie. And then we had the GI Bill. No, this guy right here. Shall I go back to school? So the GI Bill, uh, General Infantry, I think, right? GI, General Infantry Bill. Uh, if you are, are in the military for at least 90 days and you are honorably discharged, which means you didn't get kicked out, then you have certain, you have certain uh, privileges that you, that you get from the government. So, for example, under the original GI Bill, 
1944, 45, uh, you got um, lower mortgage rates, you got lower uh, loan rates, you got uh, at least one year of unemployment insurance once you came back from the Army. Um, and then, I mean, the big deal for me, uh, you get, you get, uh, you get uh, basically free college. <laughs> free college. They'll pay for uh, free public free public uh, free public college education for for four years. That seems like a pretty good deal. So that's why you see sometimes with these army recruiters in the year twenty twenty one. Hey, you want an easy way to pay for college? Come join the army for a couple years, and then we'll pay your way. Because the GI Bill it has been re upped and re upped and re upped and re upped. The last time it was re upped was in twenty seventeen. So. If you're thinking, nah, I just can't afford college, well, actually, there is a way you can do it. You need to join the military for a year or two, but you can do it that way. So, there's a way for everybody. And while I'm thinking about it, the first GI Bill, very successful. Over two million uh, men went to college because of this. Over five million men went to trade school based on the GI Bill. So that'd be like us going to Francis Tuttle and getting a, a trade certificate. So, all right, big economic boom. We're coming out. We're coming out of World War II, and we are the winners, right? The, to the winners gets the spoils. So we're now the big dog on the block. We're the ones who have the atomic bomb. Everybody's looking at us for leadership, um, and. We have all these people who are going to come back flooding into our factories, and now we're going to turn all the all of our big factories into automobiles and and commercial airplanes and all this kind of stuff, and we're going to make a lot of money here in the United States, a lot of money. So we're looking good. Uh, economic boom caused Americans to account for 40% of the entire world's money system, 40% of the wealth, and because we were so rich. Not everybody, but because there are a lot of rich people out there, what do you do when you have a lot of money? Well, you have a lot of leisure time. When you have a lot of leisure time, what do you do? Well, you come up with causes to support. And so out of the 50s, we're going to get the civil rights movement. We're going to get uh, women's rights movements. We're going to get new welfare programs. We're going to get, yeah, lots of stuff. There you go. And then we're going to get a lot of white-collar jobs, the service industry. So there's blue-collar and white-collar, right? Blue-collar means you get your hands dirty. White-collar means that you work in a, on, in a, at a desk. Okay, that's extremely simplified, right? So blue-collar, somebody who works in a factory, works with their hands. It's a blue-collar. So like a farmer or an industrial worker or, uh, the, right. And then a, a white-collar, somebody who wears a tie, you have the white collar and you wear a tie. So somebody who works in an office. Um, teachers are generally considered white collar, although you might argue that, you know, like a PE coach or, for that matter, a drama coach who is building a set up on top of the stage, uh, that would be a that would be blue collar work. You might argue uh, band teachers during marching band season. That's blue collar work. But a math teacher. That's all white collar. It's just it's just what we call it. I mean, I can't think of a time that a math teacher would ever go outside of their room, right? Shadow, do you ever leave your? Uh, he's not paying attention. I'm listening. Okay, so we got all this money. We're going to spend this money. We spend the money. Uh, that leads to increase of technology. Uh, increase of technology. We're talking about lighter planes. We're talking about faster cars. We're talking about we're talking about computers. Now we're talking about room size computer, like literally the size of the room computers for, you know, something that you plug in two plus two and it takes ten minutes to come up with the number four. But at least it does it by itself. My first calculator back when I was a sophomore at Western Heights High School had plus, minus, division, multiplication, and everybody was very excited. It had the square root button. That's right, the square root button. <laughs> hey, Middle East oil, pretty cheap at that time. A lot of people make a lot of money. So we have the frost belt, and that's the blue, right? 
the frost belt. We have the rust belt. It's the rust belt. So we're talking about the Ohio River Valley there, kind of ish. Well, north of the Ohio River Valley. Um, and so we're, we had a lot of in industries, a lot of coal, in, and we still do a lot of coal industries, and the railroads and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's, that's going to start that's going to start petering out a little bit because we don't have any other places to build railroads and et cetera, et cetera. And we have better ways uh, of, of uh, uh, powering our factories than coal. Uh, oil. <laughs> so much cleaner. Um, so people are going to start moving to the south. Why would you move to the south? Well, there are lots of reasons. One, better jobs, better climate, lower taxes in the south, in the southern states. Huh. We are friendlier, friendlier people because we say the words howdy. We have better college football teams. Well, not in Texas. And more fast food French <laughs> franchises. Yeah, that's, that's why you'd move to the South. California accounts for 20% of the population growth. Hey, we've been through, we've been through like three slides without talking about race relations. Yet again, the United States, we're just not getting it through our heads. We're not getting through our heads. Here we go. Um, the white, white flight. All right, so this is a term. I think we talked about this in, in if you were in my ninth grade class. You think about the inner city schools, or, well, not necessarily the schools. Well, we'll, say, we'll say the schools. We'll use that as an example. The inner city schools, they became much more multicultural, much faster than any other place. Well, let's just use Oklahoma City. Uh, they became much more multicultural than the surrounding schools. When in the 1950s when, and the early 60s, when Oklahoma City became desegregated and African American students came into the schools, then we're going to get a group of people who are going to say, no, I don't want my people, my kid being in a multicultural school and they're going to move out. And so you get the suburb schools that are going to be more homogenous, more Caucasian. Um, if you think about our school district, if you go up to the front, uh, that front lobby there and you start going through the pictures and you start, you know, in 1954, 56, whenever that is, and you start flipping through the, through the turnstile of the pictures, it's a very homogeneously white school, right? And then if you jump to the 80s, uh, when I was a student here, we were probably, I'm going to say, 90, 85, 90% uh, Caucasian. And for some people, that wasn't homogenous enough. And so we had the white flight from our district out further west, and of course you, you start thinking about the, the school districts further west. If you go out there today, they are pretty homogenous. Um, you start looking at them uh, when you look at the, the uh, multiculturalness of the schools. So it's called white flight. I was going to say something about percentages. Oh, but so here we are, in the, you're talking about our school district in particular in 2021. Um, so, so in the 19, all the way up through the 1980s, uh, the Caucasians were the vast majority. And then we get into the 1990s, and the Caucasians were just the majority, and the 2000s. And then we get to the 2010s, and then we, we, the, the Caucasians drop below 50%, but they're still the plurality, which means they have, uh, there are more Caucasians than any other groups of students. And then just two years ago, three years ago, uh, Caucasians dropped to the second largest plurality behind Hispanic students. So right now, in the year 2021, the plurality of students are Hispanic, and then the next group is Caucasian, and the next group is African American. And then we have, obviously, Asian and Native American and Pacific Islanders. White flight. FAA, FHA and the VA are going to make loans for people in the 1950s cheap mortgage rates, people are going to go buy these houses. Neighborhood covenants. <sighs> Neighborhood covenants. You know, we, we still have these around. Um, uh, I've never, I, I've lived in a lot of different places and I've never had a signed neighborhood covenant. But uh, uh, there's some neighborhoods that, 
that when you move in, you have to sign that says, okay, I'm, I will make sure that my grass is only, you know, only an inch and a half high and that I won't build, I won't paint my fence pink or I won't, you know, put Christmas lights on after, uh, I'll take them down after December 27th or whatever. Some of these covenants are kind of strange. But some of them you read the fine print. And here's, here's a fine print. Racial restriction. This is a neighborhood covenant. No property in said addition shall be at any time be sold, conveyed, rented, or leased in whole or in part to any person or persons not of the white or Caucasian race. And it goes on to say, the only person who cannot be white or Caucasian in the neighborhood can be a servant, like a butler or a maid. People sign these. These still exist, guys. The post, all right, get back to our happy place. The post-war baby boom. <laughs> so uh, we call them the boomers, right? Okay, boomer. Uh, the baby boomers, uh, if you were born from 1945 to, uh, I think we have different dates, but uh, 45 to 1959, about 1960. So, because after the 60s, in the 60s, we call them the hippies, right? <laughs> so uh, this, this 15 years, we call them the baby boomers, and why was there a big boom of babies? Well, we call it the Super Bowl effect, right? The Super Bowl effect says that the winning, and it's been shown through interesting uh, studies, that the Super, the Super Bowl effect says that the, the uh, city that wins the Super Bowl, for example, Tampa Bay, for example, Boston, uh, the city that wins the Super Bowl, nine months later, there's a slight uptick in the birth of babies. Do you need me to talk to you all the way through that? You think you got that figured out? I'm going to let you, okay, I, you got that figured out. But anyway, the Super Bowl effect. So we have, uh, we have, we are the winning team in World War II. We're the winning team. Yay, go us. And so uh, parties and uh, babies. Okay, moving on. You know, these pictures here. <laughs> You get the the, the uh, nurses up there, and they're all holding the babies, two two in each, and then you get the baby. I look at these pictures and I think to myself, I wonder if they ever. And you know it had to happen. I wonder if they ever were like, oh, I just put them. Oh wait, which one was this? Which one was this? I forget which baby it was. Ah, we'll just put them in the whichever cribs. <laughs> Maybe they put little toe tags on them. I don't know what they did. Just things that go through my mind. Well, here's the big three again. You've got on um, the far side, you got uh, Stalin. Boo. You've got uh, FDR sitting down, right? And then you've got uh, Churchill. And uh, this is at Yalta. So Yalta, uh, uh, these guys are going to get together in February of 1945. So do your math, 1945, February. Um, that's before the end, before uh, we were in Berlin, because that was going to be, April is when the Russians come in to Berlin, and then we get there in May. Russians. Um, so, at, but at Yalta. So at Yalta, the the big three. These three guys are going to sit down. They're going to make. They're going to make uh, some negotiations, some deals. Uh, what's going to happen with Germany? What's going to happen with Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria? And then, and then they start floating around this idea of the United Nations. All right. Stalin is going to then make a deal with FDR, and he's going to say, Hey, look. Once, once you guys help us beat Hitler him talking to the Americans, once, once you guys help us beat Hitler, then we'll go over and help beat uh, Hirohito over there in Japan. As long as, if we declare war on Japan uh, to help you guys out, Americans, uh, we want the following things. We want Manchuria and all the railroads. We want the southern half of Sakhalin Island. We want other islands. We want warm water ports uh, when we declare war on Japan. And FDR's like, sounds good, sounds good. And then, of course, we beat Hitler, and uh, Stalin does not declare war on Japan, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And then we, we drop the bomb on Japan, August 6, 1945. Japan's like, oh, man. And then right before August 9th, when we're going to drop the second bomb, uh, Stalin declares war on Japan. We then drop the second bomb, Japan gives up. Stalin goes, see? We helped you. They declared war like two days before 
the second atomic bomb. But in Stalin's mind, in the Soviet mind, well, technically they were on the winning team for two days. Is some of my 1980s anti-Russian coming through? Can, can, you, feel, can you feel the vitriol? <laughs> the irony is I represented the Soviet Union at a model United Nations in, in the 1991 at uh, St. Louis. And that I was a Russian miner. Oh, hey, Yalta was not, that was not a binding agreement. So, I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, Okay. All right. The Lend-Lease Program. We're going to go back to that. And the United States is going to focus on giving monies to, uh, to all the, to all the uh, uh, allies, which includes the Soviet Union, right, because they were, they were on, on our team trying to beat Hitler. And it turns out that we were going to give them $6 million to help them uh, buy some stuff. And then we ended up not giving them the $6 million which Stalin probably felt like that was a knife in his back because we did give money to Churchill and then ultimately France and Italy, but it is what it is. So, USSR, and this is all from world history stuff. In fact, the next several slides are all world history. Uh, the USSR is going to create that buffer zone. We're going to have the Iron Curtain, right? And we'll talk about that more later, but the Iron Curtain extending from East Germany down through Bulgaria and... Uh, uh, Stalin says we need those countries to basically be communist so that when the evil American democracies start coming our direction because they're, you know, we're, we're so evil, um, that there's a buffer zone and that they'll, they'll take out Poland first. Way to go, Stalin. Throw Poland under the bus. Good job. The IMF, the International Money, Monetary Fund, is going to be in 1944. Look at me. Look at that. I saw that. 1944, that, so that's like the... Uh, it's kind of like the World Bank. Speaking of the World Bank, right, the World Bank. And so if a country needs loans, you don't necessarily have to go to your neighbor, but you can go to the World Bank. Um, today, the World Bank, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, if we were having this conversation last year versus the conversation this year, because we have different presidents and different opinions about uh how important the World Bank is, but anyway, the World Bank, okay, uh, so this was basically led by the United States to form, to form uh, these two entities, and all of the Western demo uh, democ uh, democracies in Europe are going to jump on board. The USSR is going to go, we don't need no stinking, no, that's a different accent, comrade, we, no, anyway, they didn't want to join the World Bank. I wonder if that's going to come back and hurt them later. No, I, I, I don't want I, I know. And it does. In September of 1945, the United Nations is going to be formed. So there are going to be 55 countries. Look at that. That's not even on the slide. There are going to be 55 countries that are going to sign the charter that basically says this is League of Nations Part Two, but we're going to do better with this one. In the League of Nations, there was basically just one big committee. In, in, this, in the United Nations, we're going to have several different committees. Um, but they're also going to throw out a different idea. We're going to call it the Security Council. So the Security Council, oh man, oh, I'm going to limit myself to five minutes on this slide. The Security Council is, uh, is, there's only 15 countries in the Security Council. Ten of those countries rotate uh, every two years. So... South America gets two picks, and Africa gets two picks, and Asia gets two picks, and Europe gets two picks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those 10 countries are rotated. But five countries are permanent. Those five countries include France, the UK, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. Those five countries are special in that they never, they, they will always be on the Security Council, and what makes them more special is they have veto power. So if any one of those countries votes no on a resolution, the resolution does not pass. So it could be a vote of 14 to 1, but if that 1 was China, it doesn't pass. So if you think about all the world events in the past, well, we haven't really talked about this, but all the past the world events since 1945, either 
the Russians have not liked it or we haven't liked it. And so it's really hard to get at something through the Security Council um, passed because somebody's going to veto it, which is, I mean, you might argue that red tape's that's good because they're not just willy-nilly sending troops everywhere. And they do, I mean, they do pass things. For example, uh, uh, Resolution 667, 668, uh, against uh, Iraq when Iraq invaded Kuwait. So, during, uh, and Desert Storm and all that kind of stuff. All right. What else do I want to talk about? <laughs> so much. The World Health Organization, UNESCO, again, depending on which president, pro and con, right? Uh, president Trump did not want to deal with the, he, he was not a big fan. Uh, he took us out of the World Health Organization. President Biden put us back into the World Health Organization. All right, so more about the UN later. So what are we going to do with Germany? So we defeated them in World War II, and so we take their leaders. Now Hitler chickened out, killed himself, suicide. Uh, we take the rest of the leaders, and they um, we're going to put them on trial, the Nuremberg trials. And some of them we're going to execute. Some of them we're going to put into jail for forever. And some of them we're going to release based on the trials. But then what do you do with the actual land of Germany? Right? I mean, do we break it up and, and name it, rename it Prussia? Do we just give it to Poland? Do we divide it in half like, like the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany did to Poland? What are we going to do with it? Well, the game plan was to divide it into four separate Germanies. The four separate Germanies. So we have the French Germany, the UK Germany, the USA Germany, and the Soviet Union Germany. Ultimately, the first three are going to form they're going to they're going to uh, form into one Germany, and the Soviet Union is going to keep theirs. So we're going to have two different two different Germanies, and so um, we have the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germ Germany, and then the GDR, the German German Democratic Republic. So right, I think I've said this back when we were memorizing where all the countries in the world were, and and I was like, man, you guys you guys have it easy. I had to know the, the two different Germanys. And that's when you were like, yeah, but you had to only know one Soviet Union. We have to know all 15 of the different republics. Yeah, it's like the same thing. So, but the FRG was the good guy and the GDR was the bad guy from our point of view. And there you go. Anything else I want to talk about that? Oh, yeah, this is important. So Berlin, right? There's Berlin. Huh. Berlin, which is the capital of Germany is smack dab in the middle-ish of East Germany. Note over here that Berlin is also divided into the good guys and the bad guys. <laughs> there's, my, there's my cold war coming out. Uh, the good guys and the bad guys. And so to get, if you were a, if you were a American and you wanted to drive from the FRG to Berlin, there was one road that you could drive on and you could drive in right there and, and do whatever you need to do, and you could drive out. But you couldn't get off the road. Because that was bad guy territory. All right. We mentioned this last year. The Berlin airlift. At one point, Stalin was like, you know what? This is really looking bad for us because that side of Germany is starting to make a comeback, and our side of Germany is not doing so well because, you know, communism and Berlin the same way so uh, Stalin decides to irritate us and he is going to block that road that I just talked about just gonna block the road he's not gonna let anybody come in to good good side Berlin and so <laughs> in fact uh, Stalin says what are they gonna do what are they gonna do are they, like fly in and drop food into these people like you know day after day after day I mean the United States They've got a lot of money, but they don't, they don't have that much money. I'm mean, pleased. Besides, at some point, the United States is going to get tired of dropping food in to to uh, West Berlin. They're not going to do it forever. They're not going to do it forever. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> 6,000 pounds of food every day. We did that for 400 days in a row. 400 days in a row. And finally, Stalin's like, Okay, you made your point. You're richer than us. So the Berlin airlift was lifted and 
Eat our shorts, Stalin. All right, moving on. Hey, here's a President Truman. Remember, he took over from FDR when FDR suffered the brain hemorrhage and died 18 days before Hitler chickened out and killed himself. I've said that twice now. Uh, Truman's going to take over. He's the vice president. He's going to take over. Truman is, let's see, he's the average man's average man. So he's not, he's not like, so he'd be like a C plus, but no, he's actually a C. Like between a C plus and a C minus, he's like a C. The average man of the average man. Whew. So that would equal to like a 75 in class. Don't get C's on your report card. You want A's on your report card. Speaking of no college degree, see how, do you see how that works then? That was just coincidence. Took over from FDR after FDR's death, made the decision to drop the atomic bomb in Japan. All right. So what are we going to do about the big red menace on the other side of the world? Well, we've got to come up with a plan here. Let's see. 1946, Stalin reneges on an Iran deal. The word reneges means that he backstabs Iran and the rest of us to pull troops out of the country because Stalin's looking for cheap oil. So uh, we're going to protest that. President Truman, he's going to say, hey, Stalin, uh... We'd really actually prefer that you leave Iran because you told us that you would and you don't want to mess with us. And so, surprisingly enough, uh, Stalin backed down, which actually kind of shocked everybody, but he backed down. In 1947, we've got Mr. Secret Mr. X, although we all know his name is George F. Kennan, but Secret Mr. X is going to release this report in 47, and he's going to say, we need to come up with a plan to... to uh, handle uh, Stalin and the communists. So we're going to call this the containment doctrines. The containment doctrine is pretty simple. Wherever the communists, the Soviets are, and they're trying to expand, we're going to be there. And we're going to be putting our hand out saying, no, 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 we're going to push back. So wherever the communists are coming, we're going to push back. The containment doctrine is going to go for the next, <laughs> the next 40 years uh, because the, the, I mean, gosh, we're talking about uh, in Central America, we're talking about Southeast Asia, we're talking about all sorts of places. So, uh, and we'll get to more, more later. This is Truman, oh, sorry, this is uh, Stalin choking on his pipe, he's a big pipe smoker, choking on his pipe, uh, the pipe is labeled the Truman Doctrine. So, the Truman Doctrine, we will stop you wherever you go. The Marshall Plan. I like this cartoon. The Marshall Plan. So, the United States, we're sitting on all this money, so we're going to, we're going to help out Western Europe. I mean, they were devastated, right? World War II, millions of people died. So, we're going to send them money, and basically it's going to be, I mean, it's a loan, but... Yeah, we know they're not going to pay us back, but so we're going to give them money. France, Italy, the UK, Denmark, all, all these uh, Western Germany, we're going to give them all this money. And we're going to offer money to the Eastern Bloc, to the people on the other side of the fence, the red countries. We're going to offer them, but it turns out Stalin is going to tell them, no, do not accept that evil money from the democratic states. So they don't. And in the year 2021, they're still behind. But <laughs> it's good to have hindsight. It's good to be on the winning team. That's right. Can he stop it? Can he block the shot? And this is the Marshall Plan. So the Marshall Plan is the plan to send the money over there to Europe. $12.5 billion to 16 countries. Goodness. Also of note, there at the bottom, it's kind of a thrill. Side note, throw away. In 1948, Truman recognizes the state of Israel as a, as a country. You can, you can say the word state and country if you're, like, because the rest of the world calls them state, calls country states. Here in the United States, we have states, so we call countries countries instead of states. States of the world versus states of the United States. Hmm. Somebody should make a play out of that. All right, but anyway, we recognize Israel, and um, that's going to irritate a lot of the Arab states over there. See, it says, I said states instead of countries. See how I smoothly work that in? Uh, the, the Arab states over there.
But they're going to get over it. Well, no. <laughs> In 1947, we're going to establish the Department of Defense. We, up to this point, we've called it the Department of War, and now we're saying that's a little too aggressive, so we're going to call it the Department of Defense. See? See how that works? No, Department of War, that seems like offensive. No, Department of Defense. We are nice, peace-loving people of the world, and we will only play defense from here on out, although we do have a time bombs. Secretary of Defense is the fifth person in line for President of the United States. President, Vice President, Speaker of the House, Speaker Pro Tem, and Secretary of Defense. I think the Secretary of Education, I think I look, we looked this up last year, right? The Secretary of Education was, uh, was 14th in line for, no, 16th in line. And then like the 18th person in line was like the Secretary of Homeland Security. You think, really, the Secretary of Education should be President before the Secretary of Homeland Security? Do I have a lot to comment about that? <laughs> and I'm moving on because this is already going to go long, I can tell. All right. The Joint Chiefs of Staff are formed, the National Security Council is formed, and then inside that we have the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. So the CIA is going to be in charge of all the intelligence outside of our borders, outside, so out there in all the other the world states, out there in the world, and then the FBI is going to be in charge of everything inside the borders. So that's how that works. So um, if you're going into the if you're going into the spy business, if you want to work here, it's FBI. If you want to work out there, it's the CIA. I know people who work in both. Do you want me to get you an interview? Let me know. <laughs> North Atlantic Treaty or Oh no, they're probably gonna they're, they're gonna they're probably watching this right now. And I've just outed them. Oh no. That could be a bad. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, 1948. The countries in the the blue countries are going to form NATO and the uh, uh, the rule here is if one of those countries is attacked by Team Red, then all of Team Blue will attack Team Red. And please note, the biggest blue country is not on the map. The biggest blue country is like way over here uh, called the United States of America. So that's NATO and the United States and also Canada, but you know, the four people that live in Canada. All right. And then, of course, on this side, we call this the Warsaw Pact. So it's the Soviet Union and uh, that little group of countries. Countries that don't exist anymore. Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. Why? Communism. <laughs> Meanwhile, and it seems like we're doing a lot of world history, but it does affect us here in the United States. Japan, after we beat them, after we drop two bombs on them, they're going to play nice. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, he's going to basically script up, well, he's going to have people script up the Constitution of Japan. Everybody's going to sign it on the USS, I think the USS Missouri, and they all live happily ever after. Japan, oh, I think we have talked about this at some point. Uh, Japan basically is told they can't have any more military, that we will be their military, so they're going to take all their military money and they're going to put it into uh, electronics. And then there you go. The, the reason that you have a Sony PlayStation today or a Nintendo or whatever, because we beat them in World War II. I mean, you can make that argument. 1949. Oh, I'm about to say the C word. Everybody, here we go. 1949, China. Mao Zedong. Remember, he had, a, he had the big issue with Chiang Kai-shek, and they had the Civil War, and the Mao's going to take over, and Chiang Kai-shek is going to uh, take his group, the, the government, over to Taiwan, going to, and that's going to be the Republic of China. Mao's going to rename the Republic of China the People's Republic of China, and then we're going to get into this huge argument, we talked about this last year, with regard to, um, so who's the real China? Is it the Republic of China, the People's Republic of China? Because that person, that country gets that state gets to the vote in the United Nations. All right. 
So we're going to drop the bomb in 1945, April 6th and then April 9th. The uranium bomb and then the plutonium bomb. Russia was way, way behind us with regard to the development of bomb. And then in 1949, in September, they set off their first test bomb. It's called Joe 1, named after Joseph Stalin. Uh, Joe 1. That was three years before we predicted that they would, they would have it. And it's like, how? How did they design the bomb so fast? So as soon as they did their bomb, uh, Truman's like, oh man, we got to have a bigger bomb than that. So we started working on, well, they'd already kind of started working on it, but, but he started putting finally more money into the hydrogen bomb because we have the atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb. Those are totally different types of bombs. And if you want to have a big physics lesson afterwards, we can talk about that. But uh, the H-bomb, so in 1952, we're going to blow up an island. It's like, it's called Inutuwuk, Inutuwuk Island, uh, out there in the Marshall Islands, way, way out there. Uh, the H-bomb, it was, one bomb was the size of 450 bombs dropped on Nagasaki. One bomb, the H-bomb. I think the, the code name was like, well, it was, Ivy Mike was the name of the, of the, process and then the ne the code name for the bomb was the sausage and then <laughs> oh man and then what was the other one all right but anyway so then we dropped another one in the bikini atoll and it and it was even bigger it was 650 times the size of oh 650 times the size of nagasaki so big bada boom Did you get that reference you know that re reference um, and that one was called, the, the code word was uh, cas uh, code, Castle something, Code Castle, Castle Bravo, something, I don't remember. But the name of the bomb was The Shrimp. So the sausage and the shrimp. So there's a little boy, there's fat man, there's the sausage and the shrimp. And then there you go. And then not many long years after that, Russia drops their H-bomb. And people are like, how are they getting these bombs? Okay, the Red Scare. We don't want the communists over here. It just dawned on me that I'm all PowerPoints in red. <laughs> uh, I wonder if I did that on purpose. 1947, Truman's going to start out the Loyalty Review Board to, to ferret out communist spies. We're going to have the Smith Act. So the Smith Act basically says no communists. Um, any, anybody who purports to throw, uh, anybody who purports to overthrow the government of the United States by violent means, i.e. the communists, uh, are, we're gonna, it's against the law. You can't do that. So then Dennis versus the United States in 1951, a Supreme Court case, where you had 11 guys who were members of the Communist Party, and they were, they were going to get together to then talk about overthrowing the United States government. They were arrested before they began talking. So that goes to the Supreme Court, and they're all arguing. They're, they're, they are American citizens, just happen to be communists. And they're, they argued the First Amendment. You can't arrest us for something that we haven't even talked about yet. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, uh, you're communist, so yeah, we're going to arrest you, and we're going to throw you in jail for a long time, because you were going to talk about... <laughs> Uh, overthrowing the, the government. Ooh, that's a little scary, isn't it? That's a little scary. In fact, Justice Black, um, we've talked about him before, Justice Black wrote a dissent with his good buddy William Douglas, and his dissent was, this, no, this is called prior restraint. You can't arrest somebody for something they haven't done yet. That's like thought crime. Those of you who have read 1984, right? Thought crime. You're, go you're, you're thinking you're going to talk about it, but you haven't talked about it, and we're, mm, mm, <laughs> be careful. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the communists in the 1950s, but even that, that's a little, that's a little wonky, I don't know. 1938, we have the House Committee on Un-American Activities, um, and so this is the group that in the 30, late 30s and the early 40s, and then the 50s, they're going to go after people, like, you, you're a communist, and we're talking about even like Hollywood, because in the 1920s and 30s, it was like cool to be a communist. Like in the 1920s, it was cool in the South to be a member of the KKK. So here's cool to be a communist in the 1930s and 40s in Hollywood, and the uh, House of Un-American Activities. 
and American activities um, went after these people. And so I could probably name some stars that were, that were found to be communists. Well, off the top of my head, I can't think of any right now. But feel free to go Google famous Hollywood stars who were uh, blacklisted because they were communists. Uh, that doesn't matter. McCain, Internal Security Bill. Uh, okay, 1951. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Julius and Ethel made some poor decisions. They, uh, they're going to get involved. Uh, Julius is, Julius is a well, they're both communists. Um, they're going to get sucked in to, un, uh, sucked in by a friend who is a communist and who actually knows a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who basically works for Stalin. And they're going to convince Julius, who, who's basically an engineer, for him to start uh, recruiting people for the Communist Party and for them to start stealing blueprints. So they stole blueprints of like sonar and radar. They stole br blueprints of uh, our first, our prototype uh, fighter jet. And they stole blueprints of the atomic bomb. Which, see how that works? That's how they got the bomb. The Russians got the bomb. They did it through spies. Well, ultimately, the guy, Julius recruited somebody who recruited somebody who recruited somebody. The fourth guy on that list got, found out that he was a communist spy. He got arrested. And so he ratted out the third guy who ratted out the second guy who then ratted out Julius and his wife, Ethel. Now, Ethel actually didn't do any spy, well, I say that, but she was, she was, I might argue, she was the grandmaster because she's the one who typed up all the little things and put in the diagrams and then sent it off and, you know, licked the stamp and put it on mail and put, dear Joseph Stalin, here's how you build an atomic bomb. So, they were convicted of espionage, which under the 1917 Espionage Act, which we've talked about before, uh, that is uh, death penalty. So, you get capital punishment. So they were, they were given the death penalty. Now, actually, when they were, uh, do, oh, do I have a date on that? 1951. Seems like they were, seems like it was 54 when they were actually executed. But uh, the interesting story, in, uh, when, they were about to, when they were going to be executed, the federal prisons in the entire United States did not have an execution chamber. So they had to take the, the uh, husband and wife, Joyce and Ethel, they had to take them to Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York, which did have the electric chair. And so uh, more interesting stories about this. Jewish, these two were Jewish, and they were going to, they were going to uh, electrocute them like 11 o'clock in the evening. Well, the problem with that was they were going to electrocute them at 11 o'clock in the evening, but that was the beginning of the Sabbath because the, excuse me, Jewish people will believe that the, that the day actually starts when sundown, sundown, what am I trying to say? Yeah, when the sun goes down, then that's really the beginning of the next day. That's, that's just how the Jewish calendar works. And so technically uh, that would have been uh, on the Sabbath and to, to kill people on the Sabbath, that's eh, just... It's not kosher. It's a terrible joke. Um, so the lawyer uh, for these two uh, argued. He said, "No, no, no, no! You have, to, you can't do that. You can't execute them on the Sabbath. So we've got to put a stay out there." And then uh, one of the judges said, "Okay, we won't execute them on the Sabbath. We'll execute them at eight o'clock in the evening before the sun goes down." So they actually executed them uh, earlier than planned. He was uh, Jewish was killed. Uh, during the first shock, and Ethel survived the first three shocks. They gave her th they gave her three shocks, and then uh, the doctor went over there and put the thing in the stethoscope, and her heart was still beating. So they had to shock her twice again. And there's stories about how smoke was coming out of her uh, off her head. And anyway, awful. But the point is, don't spy for the bad guys. Truman's going to win another term. It's kind of funny. It, it kind of reminds me of the, of the uh, well, we'll get to it, but the 
Al Gore, George Bush. Oh, Gore won the. Oh no, wait, Bush won. When I when I woke up, the different person was won. Kind of like, oh hey look, uh, Trump Trump beat uh, Biden by a lot. And then they kept moving in the numbers. And then oh wait, I wake up in the morning and Biden's the president. Or for that matter, Trump versus Hillary. Uh, no, Hillary's way ahead. Oh no, Trump is. Oh, and suddenly, here we have this newspaper. Uh, this is Harry Truman and. He's running against a guy by the name of Dewey, and uh, 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 this newspaper printed the headline before all the votes were tallied, so it's kind of awkward. It's a pretty famous picture. Dewey defeats, Dewey defeats Truman, and that's President Truman going, mm, no, awkward. So always check your sources. You know, we've talked about several times, we've said, don't split the vote. Don't split the vote. Don't have Democrat, two Democrats run against a Republican. Don't have two Republicans run against a Democrat. Because every time this happens, uh, it doesn't work. Well, it actually worked this time. Okay, it's an anomaly. But uh, there you go. So uh, uh, Democrats choose Truman. The Southern Democrats choose Strom Thurmond. Oh, he's fun. You need to look up Strom Thurmond in Wikipedia or somewhere. He is fun fun. Um, progressive chose Henry Wallace. So there's really three different, ty three different types of Democrats running against uh, Dewey, and Dewey still lost. I told you a lot about Dewey. All right. All right, we've got like only like three more slides and we're done. Korea. Japan gives up Korea because of the war. Soviets control the Korea north of the 38th parallel. And really, it's Soviets. We're also talking about really the PRC, the Chinese. The U.S. controls Korea south of the 38th parallel. The NCS, NSC 68, National Security Council uh, Resolution Number 68, comes out. Uh, it's an internal memo that says, "Hey, President Truman, the idea of containment—that's great and everything. Uh, containment is, you know." If they start, if the Russians start to push out, we're going to push back on them, and we're not going to let them expand any. That's containment. But to do that, we're really going to need to like quadruple our forces. So we need to start funneling lots and lots and lots of money into the military to beat the evil Russians. So, um, and there you go. And then the. Than the national debt, <laughs> but we beat them. June twenty fifth, nineteen forty, North Korea invades South Korea. Uh, invades South Korea. So, the United Nations actually votes on this, right? The United Nations says, no, you can't do that, and the Security Council votes to send peacekeeping troops to. Remove the North Koreans back across the line of the 38th parallel into their territory and tell them to leave the South Koreans alone. So it was a, a United Nations effort. Now, 80 to 90 percent of the troops that the United Nations sent were Americans, and Douglas MacArthur. Doug MacArthur is going to be the lead general for all of the, all of the troops, the international troops. Again, most of them being American. So MacArthur, here we have uh, North Korea coming down into South Korea. In fact, wow, yellow is all North Korea. They push them all the way down to just this little bitty part there in, uh, in South Korea, and it looked like it was all over the, for the South Koreans. Then the United States shows up. <clears throat> United States shows up. <laughs> I'm such a U.S. homer. Uh, and then we're going to push them back. Now note, that's the line right there. That's the line. That's the 38th parallel. And Douglas MacArthur was told, push them out of South Korea and make sure that they'll come back. And Douglas MacArthur said, well, I've got them on the run, so I'm going to push further. So he pushed them further, and he pushed them further, and he pushed them further, and you get all the way up here to the Yalu River. And he was told specifically by the President of the United States to stop. Stop. Because the Chinese had told President Truman, hey, if the North Koreans get pushed, if the Americans push the North Koreans all the way to the river, you're not going to like that. We're going to come in. We're going to start joining the fight. And the President told MacArthur, stop advancing. MacArthur, with his 
big old head, his big old ego, <laughs> says, uh, no, we got him on the run. So he kept pushing, he kept pushing, and sure enough, the Chinese then crossed the river. And you see, the Chinese came in, the MacArthur had no idea that they were, I mean, he knew they were going, but he had no idea that how big they were, the Chinese were coming in, and they pushed, they pushed the United States all the way, again, past the original line. So, ultimately, uh, we, got, we kind of got into a stalemate, and then we're going to have an armistice. An armistice is declared in 1951. Remember, an armistice means everybody put down your weapons. It's not a peace treaty. We're just going to put down our weapons, and everybody's going to walk away. And then we'll sign a peace treaty later. And you guys may remember from last year, in, or in your world history class, that the North Koreans and the South Koreans were going to go, come to the table and sign the peace treaty three months after the armistice, and then... All the people got the pay, all the clerks and everything, they got the paper and they put it out on the table and they opened the doors and nobody was there from either side, the South Koreans or the North Koreans. Nobody came to sign the peace treaty. They still haven't signed the peace treaty. Yeah, they still haven't signed the peace treaty. 1951. That's 70 years ago. Huh. Oh, that's it. See? I told you that was it. All right. You know, the usual. Be good. I'll see you on Zoom.